Um, first of all, thank you, thank you Jane, for getting along. Um, I'm Mark Jones, this is Anne Freund. I'm a partner at Stuart and as an associate. We're both uh, litigators, so we basically deal with stuff when it all goes wrong, which tends to mean that we're at the kind of back end of any kind of issue because it's been developed, it's been usefully used, and it's only when the wheels start to fall off that we get involved. Those sorts of issues are only just starting to trickle through in the kind of issues that you guys probably hear about this sort of forum more often than when you hear people like me talking about legal issues. Uh, what that also means is that whereas the technical side of things is present and future, what I deal with is quite literally uh, late medieval period, uh, relatively speaking. The law and tech do not go particularly well together. The law lags behind massively. It's very slow to develop. It is always behind the curve, and it does not reflect where the reality of the tech and the commercial side of things are. That can give rise to all sorts of problems and uncertainty. Uh, the reason why Jamie got us along here is that recently, about six months ago, we dealt with a, a, one of the very first cases that considered a really basic and fundamental question he thought would have been answered quite a long time ago, which was, what is a cryptocurrency? But legally speaking, what is it? Is it, is it a bit of property? What rights do you have? Have you got rights against someone else? How do you transfer it to someone else? Have you got security over it? What do you do if someone defrauds you of it? All that kind of stuff. No answer to that question. There still isn't at the moment. It's still uncertain in English law. It's crazy. But that's, that's where we are, despite the fact that you know, you've got ETNs in crypto, you've got the Winklevoss trends, trying to get you know, exchange traded funds through the SEC, all sorts of complex instruments. The fundamentals still have not been nailed down. Anna's going to tell us briefly about the case that we dealt with, because it's quite interesting just for the people who've actually got cryptocurrencies. I'm then just going to try and ramble a bit about some of the, 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 the multitude of sort of legal issues that affect, that the impact or will impact on the tech side of things. Quick fun story though, it is not long ago I gave a talk to an audience of lawyers. I was trying to explain to them what the blockchain is, what, what distributed ledger technology is, how a consensus mechanism works. I thought it'd be a good idea. An American lawyer had given me a golden coin, a Bitcoin printed on it. He got them produced because he was sick of people asking what Bitcoins are and didn't believe them. You couldn't see them, you couldn't touch them. So he just produced, he made these things to give out to, to people who thought they were Bitcoin. I passed it around the room to get people to vote on if you've got it, do you own it? We stick their hands up and say, that's basically a consensus mechanism. The worrying thing was at the end of the talk, about half the people in that room thought the thing I was passing around was actually a bit <laughs> So I don't want to do the group of too much, but that's not a bad indicator for you guys as to quite how far the distance is between where the legal side of things stands at the moment and where the tech is. So with that, I'll let Anna tell you a bit about the case and then I'll come back. Okay, so um, a few months ago we acted for one of the largest cryptocurrency traders in Europe and in the Middle East. Our client was a victim of a phishing attack. The email account of a firm in which our client wanted to make a personal investment in um, was hacked and his intended investment of 100 Bitcoin was misdirected to the hacker, which we call the fraudster. Um, obviously, he wanted to recover his 100 Bitcoin, so he instructed us. Um, we obviously didn't know the identity of the fraudster, so we sued persons unknown. Um, we first used the services of the blockchain investigations firm Chain Analysis to establish what had happened with the Bitcoin. Um, that way, we found out that the vast majority of the Bitcoin, 80 Bitcoin, ended up in a wallet at Coinbase UK Limited, which is the UK arm of um, the San Francisco-based um, Coinbase. The other 20 Bitcoin were sent um, to various local Bitcoin exchanges and cashed out. Um, Coinbase wanted to help us, but they were restrained by certain confidentiality obligations, so we went to court. Um, we applied for three orders, um, a freezing order, an asset preservation order and a bank trusts order. The first two, so a freezing order and an asset preservation order, freezes assets. We ended up going for the asset preservation order because an asset preservation order freezes particular assets. So we could we were able to freeze those 80 Bitcoin. And the amazing thing about Bitcoin, of course, is 
it's identifiable. Whereas, for example, if cash is stolen, if you lose a hundred pounds and someone picks it up, you can't. It's very difficult to prove that those were your hundred pounds. Whereas Bitcoin, you can identify them. Um, the judge accepted our arguments that we, our client had a proprietary claim, but we had to discuss what Bitcoin is, is it property, is it not, and like Mark explained, that there was no legal authority, so we had to find international authorities, we had to find some commentary that basically argued it is property. We still don't know what kind of property it is, but at least the court accepted it is property and we needed the court to accept that because otherwise it wouldn't freeze the Bitcoin. And then the second interesting thing we did was um, we applied for an order called Bankers Trust Order. So that's an order that allows banks or exchanges to give you information that is otherwise confidential. So that way, that way we were able to get the information that identified the fraudster. So the result of the case was we had all the information we needed, we could contact the fraudster and we negotiated the return of the 80 stolen Bitcoin. So yeah, that's it. Why, why does, so that's hopefully an example of some ways of why these sort of questions matter because the, the slight insanity of that, that hearing we had was when I was talking about this freezing order, that it doesn't relate to specific things. You basically say, say to someone, right, we're freezing a million quid's worth of everything you've got, right? but we're not saying that any of it's particularly ours. We've got no right to any of it. We just say you can't do anything with it for the time being. What we got was an order said, those are the ones Bitcoin. They're ours. You can't do anything. The reason we couldn't get the freezing order was because the judge wasn't satisfied because she didn't know who these persons unknown were. I said, well, they, I don't know. These Bitcoin have been transferred from one uh, wallet to another wallet. For all I know, the second wallet, they could be running a hotel with these Bitcoin. They could have bought cars with these Bitcoin. I've well, got really good evidence of fraud here. And if you're telling me that with that great evidence of fraud, you're not going to give me this kind of this order to, to prevent fraud, then you, you're writing a blank check. It's a, a totally you know, clean sheet for fraudsters worldwide to use cryptocurrency in exactly the way the, I think historically, the maybe the press and regulators have, in the early days, portrayed cryptocurrencies that they are used for nefarious purposes. And that's quite important in terms of the way the laws develop because you know, it's Silk Road and Dread Pie Roberts and all that kind of stuff. The immediate legal reaction to it is a, it was a regulation one. It's to try and deal with like money laundering, criminal offence and that. So what happened was everything jumped to that regulatory level and they ignored the underlying questions of, well, what are these things? There's this new technology. It's not a right against someone, because in the blockchain you don't have a right against anyone. There is no, there is no counterpart. It's disintermediated. That's the beauty of it in some ways, one of its big selling points. Um, but it was not a thing. You can't hold on to it. You can't hand it over to somebody. So it didn't fit within existing legal categories. And that, that fundamental issue wasn't Considered. So everybody's looking at, we've well, got to do your, AM, your anti money laundering, you've got to you make sure your exchanges are you know, doing that, you know your clients and all that sort of regulatory stuff. But I always think about, well, if I <laughs> take my Bitcoin or my Ethereum or any other cryptocurrency, how do I get it back? What remedies have I got? There's a current issue at the moment. I don't know whether any of you had any holdings in Cryptopia. Hmm. Cryptopia is a huge exchange out of New Zealand. And that wasn't the millions, that's hundreds of millions. Um, that's gone under. And there's a huge argument going on at the moment. They're in court because <laughs> people didn't focus on the base on which they'd handed over. They were allowing Cryptopia to hold their cryptocurrency. I think people assumed that they'd you know, put them in the exchange and they were theirs and they were sat there safely. That may or may not be the case. What's being said is that when they did that, actually, it was the exchange that owned them. This exchange's property. So when that exchange went bankrupt, whatever cryptocurrencies were left, because they were hacked and a whole load, hundreds of millions went, whatever was left is then divided between all the creditors. Everybody's lost out. 
But there's a bunch of people there saying, well, hang on a second, because I can see from the blockchain that actually my tokens or whatever, Ethereum, Bitcoin, whatever they are, in that exchange, they're still there, so I want mine back. Thank you very much. What they're arguing at the moment is saying, well, no, you can't have them back because they're not your property. They belong to the exchange. And we're going to divide them up between everybody. It's a really big issue because if those, if, if those tokens stay in the pot, maybe everyone gets, I don't know, 20 cents in the dollar. If they go out, and people whose coins they are, they get 100 cents in the dollar, and everybody else gets a penny. It's a huge issue. And so people are either going to do really well, or they're going to lose out. Point is, my experience so far, is people get a bit carried away, and a lot of the fine print either doesn't get read, or the fine print's not even there. So to date, if you take, if you go back and look at white papers for any of the kind of big tokens, you will not find what law governs them. If anything goes wrong with it, you will not find anywhere in that paperwork that tells you you've got to go under English law and English courts, or you've got to go to the courts of the state of New York, or you've got to go to Mauritania or wherever. It's just not there. So you get, first of all, you get massive issues that you don't even know what law you're arguing about, let alone the remedies you can get. So, it's, 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 from that point, it just explodes because another, um, one of the cool, again, one of the really cool things about this sort of tech with, with DLT is, um, you, you know, no one person gets to alter the ledger. You've got nodes everywhere, or arguably in every country in the world. That creates all sorts of problems for when you want to say, well, what's the law, what's the law of transactions on a blockchain? You know, no one's chosen a law. How do you do it? Well, courts have different ways of working, are they? But one of the classic ways they do it is they look geographically at where something is based, located. Well, where's a blockchain located? I mean, one of the nice theories I've said, it was, it was probably a bit of a shock for people who own Bitcoin, but one of the, one of the approaches English law takes is to say, well, you look at this, you, what's, what's really going on with the blockchain? So it's a service. The service that's being provided is mining. So English law says, well, where's the mining service located? Well, 65% of mining is done in China. So on that basis, English law would tell you the law of the Bitcoin blockchain is Chinese law. Because <laughs> so if any of you have a problem with your, the Bitcoin blockchain going wrong, you've got to go with the Chinese law. Okay, so that's probably not what you want to hear. Although the good news, apparently, I'm told, is that Chinese law is actually pretty similar on this respect to, to, to English law. It may not be a problem. Um, that side of things super complicated, very exciting. If you're a lawyer, not so cool if you're someone who's been ripped off lost your, lost your uh, cryptocurrencies have got a problem. Um, other, I mean, at the other end, the micro end, uh, you pay for something in the cryptocurrency. Um, you affect that's a barter. There's lots of sale of goods and consumer protection, right? That all relates to money transactions. You buy something with money, all sorts of different rules apply. You buy something with cryptocurrency, you affect it exchanging apples for sheep. Yeah, that's how it's treated. It's just a barter. Medieval barter. The rules are all totally different. The law's totally different. Um, it's crazy. The good news is, Ben was a contributor to this, is English law is trying to get a grip on it. They issued a statement. That's it. That is the closest you're going to get. It's not a very long document. It's quite interesting. Um, it's not really. <laughs> it's actually not. It's not particularly legal in that sense. It's not a very dry document. It's not. It's, it's really well written. Um, and they're trying to get a grip because they think that any answer is better than no answer. People want certainty. And the trouble with the way English law works, unlike some European systems, is most stuff's got to go to court. The courts have got to get an answer before you know what the answer is. It's not great. Um, Liechtenstein's taking a different approach. We've got a friend who actually sent us the William the Robertson case. He's been one of the people who've authored this blockchain act in Liechtenstein. They've taken the view better to have a piece of legislation that deals with everything. But interesting, I was reading it a bit earlier today, rereading it, and they acknowledge one of the problems of doing that is you sort of set in stone your legal position, and yet what you're really dealing with is a rapidly, I mean, just listening to the talk just now, a ridiculously fast-moving environment. So literally within a month, two months, six months, the legislation you create, this brand new shiny regime to help everybody know exactly what they're doing, what they're creating, what the IP rights are, how you transfer property, how you give security over it, what happens in an insolvency, it's all completely redundant because the tech's moved on. The argument for English law is made, well, it's fluid, it adapts. It might be responsive, but it can respond. 
and you can go to court and you can get answers. You just don't know what the answer is going to be until you get there. Um, the uncertainty is great for people like me. Um, it's not so great for everybody else. I don't want to take up too much time because it could just. I could just there's too many sort of different. It's, 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 I want us to strain to the kind of just go starting off pieces, well, just so people where, where this strays to as well. The big issue about sort of cryptocurrencies and whether they're money um, moving to sort of deep, deep in areas and financial disintermediation international regulation implications of all of that. I went to a talk a few months ago at ING Bank. Um, this is 22nd Geneva report, and it was about the impact of, of um, fintech, big tech um, on traditional banking. And I, I went along and I thought, that might be quite interesting, we'll, we'll just see. Within about three minutes, the word Libra came up. <laughs> and pretty much the whole discussion was dominated about Libra. And I could not believe how obsessed and terrified uh, the, the bank community there were about Libra and its status, whether it got recognition, whether it was permitted regulatory. Um, and not necessarily for the reasons you, you would think. The, the main thing that came out of it was, you think, you know, all, 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 there's a lot of talk about sort of the, 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 the protections of privacy, data protection, concerns about that in this environment as well. That's a whole different topic. I think that's a complete <laughs> What came out of that was about 30% of the big international banks' profits derived from straightforward vanilla clearing of payments internationally. When you have a currency like Libra and it's used and recognised, you wipe that off the bank balance sheets and they're dead. And I mean dead in the sense that they just they don't operate, they are not solvent, they cannot work. So there you go. <laughs> So that's why I think, one end you've got the kind of micro stuff and you're bartering and it's consumer protection. At the other end, the law's stretching right over and the uncertainty stretches over to are you going to recognise it as an international currency, are you going to regulate it properly, and if you do, what are the implications of that? Sorry, I did say I'd ramble a bit, but it's maybe in the discussion you pick up any of the areas you want to. I didn't want to get too technical, I didn't want to go to case law or get too, you know, too legal about it, but it's, it's really... I love the area because I like the tech side, but the legal side, even though we're 500 years behind you, it's still pretty cool.